kids video isn't just always for kids, right? <laughs> Carrying around worry. I do. A reminder to take that worry uh, to the Lord. It's a good reminder. All right, boys and girls, we'll let you guys head back up to Children's Church. You'll see back there Miss Jamie. Marsha's back there. They will get you guys where you need to go. Just head on back. All right, if you're going to stay in here with us, most of you guys are. Uh, like last week, I have a few announcements. There's lots of stuff. As spring comes along, there's lots of stuff to talk about, which is good. Okay, so I'm gonna, gonna chat with you guys for just a couple minutes before we jump into the lesson. But uh, So fourth, fifth grade group and youth. You guys are meeting today as normal, fourth, fifth grade group in this room, uh, middle of the afternoon. Youth, we're here tonight, uh, 6 to 7.30. Okay, so normal schedule for you guys. I want to talk to you guys this morning about uh, Easter services in a little bit more detail, okay? So Saturday night, the Saturday night before Easter, okay? Uh, it's what we're calling our Easter, Easter vigil service. Uh, it's going to begin, there's, there's a time change on that, okay? We had it scheduled for 6 o'clock. It's actually going to begin at 7.16 p.m., and that's a very specific time. Because as I've kind of gone through and, and researched this, one of the things I've learned about this service, I've never done one before, right? So this, this is new to me. 44 years being Christian, being in church, never, never done one of these things before. It is actually the first service of Easter, not Good Friday, not Holy Saturday, the first service of Easter. So it can't begin until sundown on Saturday night because it goes back to the way the Jewish people kept the days. So Jesus, right, goes and is crucified on Thursday. We call it Maundy Thursday now, right? He goes to the cross at 9. He's taken off the cross at 3. He's in the tomb before sundown. That's day one. The Jewish people kept track of days from sundown to sundown, not midnight to midnight. Okay, so sundown to sundown from Thursday to Friday is day one, right? Day two is then sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. And then at sundown on Saturday, Easter actually begins. So this service is the first actual service of Easter. So we can't start it until sundown. Sundown for Ledger and Gales Ferry on that particular date as uh, done by the National Weather Service is 7.16 p.m. So our service will begin at 7.16 p.m. It'll last uh, somewhere between 60 and 75 minutes. Uh, it's going to be organized. It's going to look a lot like our candlelight service. It's going to be dark in here, right? We'll light the Easter candle up front. There'll be some others around the room. We won't be holding them this time. Uh, our, our deacons will assist with that. And then there'll be eight parts to this service. Each part has a reading from the Old Testament, like the creation account, uh, or Abraham and Isaac, or the parting of the Red Sea. So that passage from the Old Testament is read, to which one of our deacons or deaconesses will respond with the reading from a psalm and a prayer. And then after that, is a part for, in, in each of these eight parts, is a part for the congregation to engage. So a couple of times we'll sing. Uh, once we'll do communion. Uh, we'll renew our baptismal vows. There'll be a time of, of quiet prayer. So this is going to be a very different service than we're used to doing here. I'm actually quite excited about it. Uh, but we will stream it. Uh, and as of now, there's, there's no child care for this. So we'll have packets and activities and things like that for children to do. Uh, but that'll be here that evening, 7, 16 p.m. Then Easter morning, we're not going to do a catechism question that morning. It'll be a regular Easter service. Uh, there'll be one at 9. That'll be normal service. It'll end right around 10. Uh, second service will begin at 1030, same service. Uh, but then afterwards, outside, we'll do our egg hunt. We'll do over here on the playground, the little biddies first. So like the ones through three-year-olds, we'll let them go first out here on the playground. And then we'll take the uh, preschool kindergartners. They'll have their own little area roped off out there in the, in the front. And then the first through fifth graders, which is generally when we kind of keep it open, uh, will be spread out all up front. Uh, and then after that, we encourage you, if, if you come, bring a picnic lunch. And we're all just going to spread blankets out, put our chairs up. Uh, and hang out if you want to. So that's Easter. So you can pray for no rain on Easter because our Easter this year is very dependent on no rain, right? No rain, at least until the afternoon. 
Okay, in prep for that, uh, next Saturday, mark your calendars down for this, next Saturday, March 27th, from 1 to 3, uh, we're going to do a church work day in here, right? It needs to, we need to mop the gym, sweep, like every room, balconies, preschool, kindergarten room, nursery, all this stuff needs to be go through. There's lots of stuff that needs to go to the dumpster. We need to clean stuff out. Uh, we're going to be very safe about this, right? We'll sign you a room, uh, doing mass, we'll open windows, all this kind of stuff. But from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock, uh, next Saturday, March 27th, uh, church kind of clean up. Moving on, still got several more of these. Uh, nursery, right? So on Easter, we are going to offer uh, a nursery for our Easter morning services. We are still looking for help for that. Uh, and then going forward, we're going to have to figure something out, right? If, if what we do here with regards to children is volunteer driven. Uh, so if, if we can't staff one, we can't staff one, right? But we're going to do our best if we have to move kids around, things like that. Uh, but there is in your church app an opportunity in there for you guys to, to volunteer to, to do this kind of stuff. If you go down, it's on the bottom left-hand corner, uh, get involved, right? You can, you can sign up uh, to help with that. All right, two more and I'll be done. The building, we're starting to get more and more questions uh, about using the building, right, as things begin to open up. If you're following along what's going on in the state of Connecticut, this past Friday was a big step, right, in things beginning to kind of open up in the state of Connecticut. So we're going to start allowing people again in to use the gym. There's a process to go through. Uh, there's a building use form that will be loaded up in the Connect tab uh, in the church app. Uh, it it kind of labels, it, it asks questions, you know, what do you need it for, when do you need it, da-da-da-da-da, right? Uh, labels out who's responsible for cleaning, if, if there is something to do with COVID there, who's responsible for contact tracing and all that, uh, if it's another group, insurance waivers, all this kind of stuff. So if someone asks, and there are some times, the gym of, is going to be available on, on Mondays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Tuesdays and Wednesdays, it's in the evenings, it's taken, right, with AHG and with worship practice. Uh, we don't charge for that. We, we take donations if someone wants to give them, and we'll probably use those uh, just to pay down the note on the building here as we go through, right? And then last, but certainly not least, uh, and I should have announced one of these last week, we have two new additions to our church family. Uh, Chris and Julie Spears had Dylan Alexander Spears at 3.12 a.m. on Friday, March 12th. Uh, he was born 8 pounds, 8 ounces. Everybody seems to be doing well there, right? But that's a new... Uh, new little boy that's it's part of our church family. And then Daisy and Brandon Phillips, a uh, young couple, had Isabella Grace Phillips at 2.26 p.m. this past Thursday, March 18th. Uh, she was born 7 pounds, 5 ounces. So at some point, you'll probably see meal trains come out for these guys, right, as we start to, uh, start to help out with that. Uh, so keep an eye out for those. That's another reason, right, that you fill out the connection card. That's how we send this kind of information out when, when, when families get sick or when they, you know, have to go in for surgeries or have babies, right? One of the things we do uh, is help provide them some meals for a period of time, right, just to take some of that stress off of them. So keep an eye on your emails about that. A couple of them probably should have already gone out. Whew. Okay. That was a lot. Grab your catechism books. Uh, open up to question 10. I had to make a, an executive decision this week. Uh, as, as I was preparing for this question, question 10, there was just too much in it to do it in one Sunday. So we're going to have to break it up between two Sundays. Uh, we're going to deal with the Sabbath this Sunday, and then we're going to deal with honor your father and mother next Sunday. Uh, otherwise, I was going to have about an hour-long message, and that just probably wasn't going to fly that well. So let's read the question, uh, and then today we'll deal with one of the topics. Question 10, which if you realize now, we're almost 20% of the way through this thing, right? There's 52 questions. We're on question 10. What does God require in the fourth and fifth commandments? Fourth, that on the Sabbath day, we spend time in public and private worship of God, rest from routine employment, serve the Lord and others, and so anticipate the eternal Sabbath. Fifth, that we love and honor our father and our mother, submitting to their godly discipline and direction. So today, we're dealing with the Sabbath, right? Sabbath is one of these things... Uh, the concept and, and, and the belief in the Sabbath has been something that has encouraged uh, and strengthened the faith of Christians and, and, and helped set apart, and I, and there's a Christian distinctiveness that goes along with it for 2,000 years. Okay? It has been a huge 
blessing to the church. Uh, but it has also been a concept that has caused some confusion and some division. And there have been times where it's just been outright hostility over what's the Sabbath, right? What is it? When is it? What can you do on it? What can you not do on it, right? So that's what we're going to dive into today. What does God require? Today we're just going to deal with the fourth commandment. We're going to talk about what the Sabbath is, when it is, and then what does God say about what we do on the Sabbath, okay? I'm going to pray for us, and, and we're going to jump in. Lord Jesus, Lord of the Sabbath, uh, we pray for your wisdom and your guidance. As we look through your scriptures, your word, through the Old Testament, as we look through your scriptures and your word through the New Testament, help us to understand that when you say, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, help us to understand what that means for us. Uh, God, give us a, a vision of the Sabbath. And then help us take the necessary steps to be faithful in remembering it. I pray all this through the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So if, if you're writing notes down, the first question we're going to ask, right? How do we remember the Sabbath? How do you remember the Sabbath? Okay, question number one. It's a question that's been subject to debate between Jewish and Christian circles. What exactly does the fourth commandment require? I'm going to read it. It's going to be up on the screen. From the Ten Commandments. This is Exodus chapter 20. I'm going to pick up in verse 8. Go 8 through 11. God speaking to Moses says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it, you shall not do any work. You, or your son, or your daughter, or your male servant, or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner, or the, the immigrant who is in, within your gates. For in six days the Lord's made the heavens, and the earth, and the sea, and all that's in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. That word Sabbath is actually, it's a transliteration of the Hebrew word. It's a Hebrew word Shabbat. It literally means to rest right, to cease, to stop. This is not the first place it actually shows up in the Bible. You hear it in the Genesis account, in the account of creation, right? All the way back at the beginning of the Bible, God goes through and creates the heavens of the earth, and then you get to Genesis chapter 2, and it says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested. He Sabbathed on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. For six days, six days, whether you believe they're literal 24-hour days or you know, this goes back to one of the previous questions, right? Or the day age view or the framework view. God did all his work of creation and when he finished... He stopped creating, and he rested. And it's important to know that when, when God Sabbathed there on that seventh day, right, he did not cease all activity. He ceased doing the work of creating. God continues and continued then to be involved. He continues to uphold the universe by the word of his power, right? He continues to be involved in human history. He chose Abraham, right? He called Moses. He appeared to Israel at Sinai. He spoke to Elijah. He came to earth as Jesus, right? The, the list goes on and on and on. When God Sabbathed, he didn't just stop and do nothing. He continued to be involved in history. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind as we look, right, God continues to be active. He isn't just doing the work of creating anymore. And that's an important distinction for those that might have a very restrictive view of the Sabbath. 
So God Sabbathed on that seventh day. Then human history kind of continues on until God calls Abraham. Abraham has Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob has 12 children, 12 sons, more children than that, lots of daughters. Goes to Egypt, becomes the nation of Israel. And God calls Israel out of Egypt, rescues them, brings them into the desert, brings them to Mount Sinai. And then he begins to work the Sabbath into their weekly routine. The structuring of their week revolves around the seventh day and the commandment. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not work. Nobody, even the animals. Israel is instructed, six days you work. The seventh day you rest. And for them, that seventh day is Saturday. Saturday in the Old Testament, what we think of as Saturday is the Sabbath. And this is their routine each week in and out. And Israel is to do this to keep a day set aside, holy, special, pure, set aside for God, right? And this is the primary way that, that, the, that the Shabbat, right, that the Sabbath is built into the lives of Israel. Their week revolves around it. Six days they work, one day they rest. Six days they work, one day they rest over and over and over and over again. But that's not the only way it's involved. Yes, it is about work. Yes, it's about rest. But the Sabbath also takes on spiritual terms, right? In the day of Yom Kippur, right? The day of atonement. Turn in your Bibles or, or look up on the screen if you want to go with me to Leviticus chapter 16. I'm going to read verses 29 through 31. God is again speaking through Moses. And it shall be a statute to you forever that on, in the seventh month... On the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict yourselves and shall do no work, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For on this day you shall make atonement to cleanse you, and you shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. It's a Sabbath of solemn rest to you. And you shall afflict yourselves. It's a statute forever. So once a year, in the seventh month, on the tenth day, there is a Sabbath of solemn rest where the high priest, if you go on to read this, enters into the temple, into the most holy of holies, and goes through a ritual where he makes atonement for the cleansing of the entire nation of sin. And as he is doing that, the rest of the nation is Shabbating, right? And the, the, the Bible translates it as, as they are afflicting themselves. That's, that's a term, it's, boy, it's, it's one of those where there's just really not a good English term for the Hebrew word there. It involves, it's, it's a period of self-denial. They are in prayer primarily, and they are fasting on that date. That's the affliction, right? They are denying their flesh through fasting. They are denying their sinful thoughts through prayer, but it's a day of rest and prayer and fasting, and so the concept of the, sh of the Shabbat begins to take on even more spiritual terms. It's a holy day of self-denial and of prayer. It shows up again at the beginning of the major feasts for Israel. If you continue flipping in Leviticus, you'll eventually come to Leviticus 23. Verse 3 says, he's repeating the commandment again, six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It's a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. Now, the Sabbath becomes a time to gather. That the people of God, they're not just resting. It's not just a time of, of prayer and of fasting. It is a time of gathering. It's a convocation, right? And so the Sabbath begins, the Israel gathers together, and then they begin these major feasts, the Feast of First Fruits, right, which is thanks for the barley, and the Feast of Booths, which is thankfulness for their rescue from Egypt. And so the Sabbath begins to come, this, this day where, where the people begin to gather and to, and to celebrate and to give thanks but it doesn't stop there, right? This is a concept that keeps going. There is a Sabbath year. Leviticus 25, 1 through 7. The Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say, When you come into the land that I'm going to give you, the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. 
For six years you shall sow your field, and for six years you shall prune your vineyards and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You shall not reap what grows, excuse me, yeah, you shall not reap what grows of itself in your harvest or gather the grapes of your undressed vine. It shall be a year of solemn rest for the land. The Sabbath of the land shall provide food for you, for yourselves and for your male and female servants, for your hired workers and the sojourner who lives for you, for your cattle and all your wild animals and in your land. All its yield shall be food. So every seventh year, this agricultural society stopped doing agriculture. And they let the land rest. No work. And to make it even more interesting, every seventh Sabbath year was the year of Jubilee, which is in the very next passage. You shall count seven weeks of years, seven times seven years. So the time of the seven weeks of years shall give you 49 years. And you shall sound a loud trumpet on the tenth day of the seven month. And on the day of atonement, you shall sound the trumpet throughout your land. And you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. When each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his clan, that 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of itself nor gather grapes from the undressed vines, for it is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You shall eat the produce of the field. And it goes on to describe how debts are canceled. Right? People that have had to, to indenture themselves into servitude, to pay, they, they are freed. Right, All of the land that, gets sold, that was sold in that 50 years reverts back to who it was originally assigned to. For, if you're following the Bible, it's going to be in the, in the book of Joshua. Right, It's an entire reset. It's a, sab- it's a year of jubilee. It's the Sabbath of Sabbath years. There's plenty of evidence that Israel celebrated the Sabbaths weekly, that they celebrated on the feasts. Sadly, there isn't one drop of evidence that they ever did the year of Jubilee. And you have to think that just good old-fashioned human greed came into that, right? But that's the picture of the Old Testament from the Sabbath. The people of God's week was oriented around it. Six days they worked, seventh day they rest, right? The Sabbath began all their major religious services. The Sabbath was, was given not only to, to, the, to the wealthy, but to the poor, not just to the Israelite, but to the immigrant, not just to the human, but to the animal and to the land, right? The Sabbath is, is a day of rest. It's a day of worship. It's a day of prayer. It's a day of fasting. It's a, it's a spiritual day. And Israel continues doing this all throughout the Old Testament, even when they're hauled off into exile, right? They continue to observe the Sabbath to the extent that they're able. But by the time you get to the New Testament, Jesus arrives. The Sabbath has been going for over a thousand years. And the Jewish people have taken God's commandments to, to rest and not to work very, very seriously. But the question that they've been wrestling with is, well, what's work? Like, what can you do and what can't you do? And they have come up with piles and piles and piles of rules that you have to follow in order to keep the Sabbath. Like, you can't walk more than a certain distance on the Sabbath or you're working. You can go get an egg out of your chicken house, but you can't move the chicken to get it. I mean, there's all, it literally, there's, hundreds and thousands of rules that they have to follow. And I think it's fair to say that by the time Jesus comes onto the scene, it's actually more work to keep the Sabbath than it is to just go to work. The Sabbath has become this crushing discouraging burden that caused social strife because really only a few of the wealthy, educated people, generally you see them in the Bible as the Pharisees could really keep it. They're the only ones that had enough money to keep all the rule and and, and to do all this stuff. And the common people were looked down on because, I mean, my goodness, you can't do all this stuff. 
And so it becomes all about following the rules. And Jesus bursts onto the scene and goes, listen, guys, you're missing the point. You're entirely missing the point of this. Mark 2, 23, it says, One Sabbath, he, Jesus, was going through the grain fields. He's walking through a wheat field or a barley field or corn. We don't know what kind of grain field. He and his disciples. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. They just started popping heads off the grain and just eating them. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath? These guys are breaking the rules. You can't do that. That's work. And Jesus said to him, well, have you never read what David did? This is from the Old Testament, that he was in need and hungry, and those who were with him, he entered the house of God. David goes into the temple, the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and he ate the bread of the presence. David ate this special bread and that's, that's inside the, uh, in the temple, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, listen, guys, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. God, Jesus goes, guys, you are thinking completely backwards on this. Right? You are treating this like, like God created this day and then said, you people, you got to keep this day. And here's all the rules you got to follow to keep the day. He goes, no. God created people and then he made a day for you to rest and to worship. Jesus says, if you doubt me on this, just remember, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. So when it comes to telling you what's required on the Sabbath, the buck stops with me. It doesn't go over very well. Again, I'm going to pick up in, in chapter 3. This is the very next passage. Again, he entered a synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he'd heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to harm, to save life or to kill? It was lawful on the Sabbath that if somebody was in mortal danger, if they were dying, you could give them medical care. But if it could wait till the next day, you were required to wait. Jesus says, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to harm? Can I heal this man on the Sabbath? And nobody said anything. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. And the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. This begins, Mark chapter 3 begins Jesus' march to the cross, which we're going to celebrate in just a couple of weeks. It's over the Sabbath. What are you doing on the Sabbath? Leaders were like, nope, can't do that. And Jesus was like, yep, you can do good on the Sabbath. It's not meant to be a burden. It's meant to be a blessing. So Jesus starts to change it and unwind it from all the rules. And then, after Easter, the church makes another change. Jesus is crucified, gets placed in the tomb, is resurrected on Sunday. So the church begins to celebrate their Sabbath day, not on Saturday anymore, but on Sunday because that's the day their Lord, our Lord, rose from the dead. So the Jewish people, right, if they're Orthodox Jewish people, they still celebrate the Sabbath on Saturday. Christians celebrate on Sunday. Now, as you can imagine, as the church begins to take root and begins to grow, and it's a primarily Jewish church, they start kind of butting heads over, what do we do here? How much of the old Sabbath rules do we have to keep? So the apostles start writing letters Paul is writing letters in his letter to the church at Rome in Romans 14, 5. He's dealing with the Sabbath. People are arguing over the Sabbath. It's got to be this day. It's got to be this day. You got to do this. You got to do this. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. They're arguing over the Sabbath. And Paul says, pick your Sabbath, basically. Which day do you want? Some people say it's this day. Some people say it's this day. Some people say you should do it this day. Some people say you should do it this day. Paul says, follow your conscience. His words free us from the binding commitment of a Sabbath to a particular day. He goes on to say in Colossians 2, 
16 and 17, this is Paul writing again, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. They are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is Christ. So you put all of this stuff together, right? The Sabbath is a day of rest. It's a day of spiritual activity, of prayer, of fasting, of gathering, of, of, of giving thanks, of worship, of serving others. Generally, Christians observe it on Sunday, though you don't have to. And we are to continue to do this all the way up until the end. Because the day is coming when we'll finally enter into that full and complete Sabbath of rest in the new heavens and the new earth. Which is what, if you look at our catechism, fourth, that on the Sabbath day we spend time in public and private worship of God, rest from routine employment, serve the Lord and others, and so anticipate the eternal Sabbath. All right, there's your history lesson on the Sabbath, right? The walk through the Bible. So what do we do with that? How do you remember the Sabbath? Here's point number one. You ready? You work with a purpose. You're like, wait, hold on a minute. Colossians 3, 23 through 24 says, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you'll receive an inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, right? You work with a purpose. You work not just for yourself, but for Jesus. You work to support your family, right? You work with a purpose to support. Work is required Outside of, of some extraordinary, unusual circumstances, we as Christians are required to work five or six days a week. That can be in the home, that can be in the marketplace, that can be in the military, that can be at a, at a nonprofit, whatever that is. We are to work to feed and support ourselves and our families. Right? First Thessalonians has a verse that goes along and says, if a brother, a fellow Christian does not work, he should not eat. We are required to work if we are capable of working. So we work hard to support ourselves, our families, our churches. We work to bring glory to Jesus. Five or six days of the week, you do your work. Right? You as a Christian, right, you should be known as a model employee, hardworking, honest, fair, generous, wise, knowledgeable, right? Whenever you do, whatever you do, whether it's at home or in an office or in school or wherever you are, you do it well because you are working ultimately not for your boss, but for your Lord Jesus Christ. And that what you're doing is a direct reflection on him. Knowing, we go in to do our work knowing that as the world looks at us as Christians, that the quality of our work, that the diligence of our work, that the honesty of our work will either commend Christ or bring him down. That we will either, through our work, show others the glory of Jesus or will sully his reputation. So whether you're in school, in middle school, or high school, or whether you're home life, whatever you do reflects on Jesus. Do it to the best of your ability. The Sabbath, the whole purpose around the, the, the orientation of the week to the Sabbath is five or six days a week we work with a purpose to support our families, to bring glory to Jesus. But you're like, wait a minute, we're talking about the Sabbath, aren't we? Yes, we are. But then you rest with a purpose. One day a week, you give to the Lord. One day a week is God's, and you rest from your job. Okay? You don't do your job one day a week. You don't make your employees do it. Right, guys? We should not be working seven days a week. We need to be able to put it down and walk away. Now, as a former CPA, right, that's what I was in, in 13 years before I became a pastor, right, this time of year, right now, I'm so glad I'm not an accountant anymore, right now is a miserable time for accountants, right, from January to, to, to the middle of April, 
sometimes you have to work. There were busy seasons where I worked seven days a week for weeks on end. And I will tell you, as you guys that work on submarines, as you guys that do, I mean, something when you, it just wears you down. It is just kind of mentally and physically and emotionally just damaging almost. It's sometimes necessary. I'm, I'll, I'll leave that out there, right? It's sometimes necessary. But work, in my opinion, is, is a major idol for many Americans, right? We, we find our identity in it. We are what we do. You ever notice that? You ever go talk to somebody? What's one of the very first questions you ask them? What do you do? Because that's, that's a defining question. What does this person do, right? Oh, I am a Navy officer. I am an accountant. I am an engineer. An engineer. It becomes part of who we are. So it, kind of a diagnostic question for you, right? If you can't put it down, if you have the opportunity to put it down and you can't put it down, that's a bad sign. That's a warning sign. That it's become too much of your identity part of what God has built into your weekly routine is a day of rest that you put it down and you walk away right that you that you break the idol of, of, of self-sufficiency right it this reminds us that we are dependent on God and this this is what's so mind-blowing about the Old Testament stuff right there was a a year where they did this where they didn't farm and God said if you're faithful that sixth year will produce enough to get you through the sixth year, through the seventh year, and through the eighth year. The Sabbath is about trusting God that he will provide, that even if you don't pick up the laptop today or you don't answer the email today, that the Lord is going to take care of you. So you are meant to rest with a purpose, to rest from your job and to recharge. This is the word that... that I started really using this week, right? The Sabbath is meant to recharge you and to refresh you. There aren't really restrictions on what you can do or what you can't do. You're not supposed to work. If it's, if it's something that's going to, to drain you, I would say then, then, then whatever that is, Sabbath's probably not a good day to do it. Whatever you pick, Sunday, but that's going to be different from person to person, right? If you have a, a, a job where you're, you're sitting at a desk from week to week, then getting out and doing something physical on the Sabbath, whether it's working in the yard or, or building a new shed or something like that, that might recharge you, even if you end up physically tired from it. Whatever it is, if it's reading a book or, or cooking or grilling or going for a hike or playing a basketball game or whatever it is, right? If it recharges you, do it. It should, even if it physically wears you out, help recharge your batteries. So we rest with a purpose. We rest from our jobs. We recharge our batteries. And we worship. We spend time in public and private worship of God. Public for us generally means that we're involved in some kind of local church. It's hard to do public worship outside of a local congregation, whether that congregation meets in a church or in a home or in a park or wherever it might meet. Can you do public worship? Uh, yeah, you can, but let's be honest, nobody's going to. And it could be, according to Paul's words of the New Testament, any day of the week. But again, most churches don't meet on any day of the week. You can find sometimes church services on Saturday evening. You can find them on Sundays. Sometimes you can find them on Wednesday nights, but you're kind of stuck with Sunday. So you say, okay, public worship. Now that re brings up the question that if you're really kind of thinking about this, okay, what does that do with online worship? Right? Is that public worship? And the short, simple to answer that question is not really, no. Does that mean it's bad? No. 
a time like this, time of virus, right? Online worship has been a necessity. Going forward, if you're sick, if you're shut in, if you're traveling, if you're checking out a church, if you don't have a local church, right? Then these are all appropriate uses of online church, but it's not public worship. Now, for those that are watching online, I'm not telling you that it, it's time to come walking back in the door next week. But I am saying online worship is not meant to be a permanent thing. So, if you want to run a quick diagnostic on where you are, ask yourself this question. If you're worshiping at home, do you long to be part of a church again? Do you miss it? If so, that's okay. That's a good sign, actually. If not, that's a warning sign. Public worship is gathering with a body, right? The, the overall, the, 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 the biggest definition, the biggest descriptor, really, that the New Testament gives to the church is a body, right? And a body must be together. A hand in one place and a kidney in one place difficult for a body to function. So we come together in public worship, but we also engage in private worship, right? Just coming to church for an hour or an hour and 20 minutes on Sunday isn't enough. How do you worship God on your own? The Sabbath is meant to be, whatever your day is meant to be a day of prayer and of reflection and, and of meditation. It, it's a solemn day, right? Your worship on that day should not stop with church. It should continue. Maybe in the morning before, maybe in the afternoon afterwards, maybe in the evening before you go to bed. It doesn't say it has to be the whole day. But maybe, maybe a way to do it is at night, tonight, before you sit down, before you go to bed, you read back through your notes that we've taken today on talking about the Sabbath. And you think about them. You meditate on them. You pray about them. What does this mean? What does this mean for my life? How does this need to change? You look back up some of the scripture verses that maybe you wrote down. That's a way that you privately worship on the Sabbath. Maybe next Sunday... Right? You get up in the morning, you read through what we're going to be talking about next Sunday. And you think on it, and you read the scripture verses, and you pray. Right, These are all ways that we can privately worship and continue this, this idea of the Sabbath being a day of public and private worship. So we rest from our jobs, we recharge our batteries, we worship the Lord both publicly and privately, and finally, we figure out how to serve way to serve the Lord and others. You can do it here on Sundays in nursery, children's coffee hour once we get that started back up, or you can do it on another day. Clothing exchange. Back before all this mess hit, we ran an upward basketball program, which is an outreach to our community. Back before all this mess hit, one Sunday a month, we went to Radgowski Prison over in Montville and did a worship service and Bible study with the prisoners there. Back before all this mess hit, we went down to a nursing home in uh, Groton and Mystic and did a church service on them for that afternoon. There are so many different ways that, that, that we are looking to get back involved, but we serve the Lord and others on the Sabbath. That's part of what it is. We worship, we gather, we serve, we rest. And when we do this, church, we are living as if that eternal Sabbath is already here. Because it, it, th there's an idea, I think, in people's head, when you get to heaven, you're not going to be working. You will. When you were in the garden, they were working. After sin, work just became like this miserable thing, right? Thorns and thistles. and right? There's thorns and thistles in work now. There's going to be thorns and thistles in work until the end. But then, in that eternal Sabbath... We'll continue to work, and we'll continue to rest, and we'll continue to worship God and worship Jesus. We'll continue to serve the Lord. It'll just all be perfect at that point. So today, your Sabbath day, is a day of worship. It's a day of service. It's a day of rest. It's a day to recharge. Five or six days, Monday through Saturday, work with a purpose. 
Support yourselves, support your families, bring glory to Jesus through the work that you do out there. But whatever your Sabbath day is, set it aside and rest and recharge and worship and serve. And I tell you, if we remember it, like the countless generations that have gone before us, it will be a blessing. I'm going to pray for us. Lord Jesus, Lord of the Sabbath, God, impress this in our minds. Help us to take stock. Right? Where, where do I need? Where do I need to change? How do I need to change? What's my purpose on the Sabbath? Lord, and help us to become more faithful as we follow it and try to keep it holy. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. There are some, some table talk questions for you. I almost left those out. I remembered those as I, uh, as I started praying there. So if, if you want to use these, I encourage you to. This is a way you could, uh, the whole private worship thing, right? When is your Sabbath? And what's your purpose? I think that's a very good question to think through. What's your purpose for your Sabbath? That will help you kind of think big picture through what do I do on my Sabbath, right? What's your purpose? How will you incorporate both public and private worship? Like, what's that going to look like for you and your family? Right? What's your purpose in your Sabbath? How are you going to publicly and privately worship in your Sabbath? I'll give you a second to write those down. I still see people writing. And then last, third question, what are some ways in which you can serve the Lord and others? Right? Is that piece missing? If so, what does it look like? What are some ways in which you can serve the Lord and others? All right, very good. Thank you for being here with us today, whether you're in person, whether you're online. Uh, we do need to break the gym down, so if you guys don't mind stacking them, we'll, we'll slide them over to the side. Otherwise, God bless you, uh, and we'll see you next time. Have a great week.